This review was made possible by Todd Pasolik and his Patreon pledge. If you have a movie, TV show, or a video game that you'd like me to review, please consider visiting my Patreon page. The incentive will be reset very soon, and pledges are very limited, so keep an eye out for it. The fear of blood tends to create fear for the flesh. This was said during the intro sequence of Silent Hill for the PS1, released in North America on January 31st, 1999. Developed by Konami Computer Entertainment Tokyo, or more specifically Team Silent, and published by Konami. You know, when it was still a respected publisher and developer and company, before it became, well, Konami. It was originally intended to have a more Hollywood feel to appeal to Western audiences, and it was the first time Konami had ever tried to do that. Oh, wait! But Team Silent essentially said fuck that in presumably an awkward passive-aggressive method because it was mainly made up of misfits within the company and strived to make a more atmospheric and psychological experience. Now before I go any further, I just need to clarify that I have had prior experience to Silent Hill before this review was requested, which leads us back to Metal Gear Solid, which was actually how I first heard of Silent Hill. During MGS's original distribution run, it came packaged with an ad for Silent Hill. It only featured stills with realistic human characters and was accompanied by the tagline, Welcome to Hell. My brother, his friends, and I were stricken with curiosity, so when we discovered the game was out, we asked our mom to buy it for us. And since she didn't read the ESRB level, she did! So it was me and my brother scrunched up to the TV, readying ourselves to unveil the mystery the game contained. And then this happened. We found ourselves stumbling across a mangled corpse with blood spattered everywhere. Crawling deeper into the rabbit hole, we emerged into a dark and decaying alleyway covered in rust and blood where, at the end, we discovered... What is this? What's going on here? If my mom saw this scene when we were playing, she would have immediately returned the game to Toys R Us and dragged our asses to church. As if the shit weren't probably scared out of us already, my brother and I were greeted by God knows what these things are, and tried to run away. Only to find ourselves at a dead end, literally and figuratively surrounded by dread. The creatures closed in on us, and all we could do was die. I was too frightened to continue after that. I walked out of the room and didn't touch the game for 15 years. Looking back, this was an absolutely brilliant opening. This was supposed to be a horror game after all, and it did its job in setting the mood and scaring away those who weren't strong enough to brave the darkness that the game contained in the first five fucking minutes. I fucking checked out. I mean, I was gone, but my brother kept playing, and I went back to playing games like Croc and Jumping Flash 2 and <clears throat> Bussy 3D. As I said before, I have in fact played this game. I finally got around to playing it in 2014. The footage you're seeing right now is of my playthrough on GoFace Gaming, the channel I host with Aaron 64 And for a show that's supposed to be centered around jokes and commentary, we weren't completely immersed a lot of the time, and that's probably our own fault. I wonder what happened here. <gasps> there must have been some tomato fights here. Kind of like the ones in those villages in Spain. Those are fun. Hello? Is there a tomato fight going on here? It felt right. She slowly licked and tickled his peony. And because she was so smart, combined the words in her head, like an expression explorer of old. Slickled, she thought. I'm slicking his peony. No matter how brilliant her wordplay, the result was the same. Gary's peony was now erect. It felt like a quality bar of peony-scented soap in her hands. Without warning, she gave him a swift headbutt, because men like that. But for the sake of this review, I did play it a second time in order to soak everything in. You play the role of Harry Mason, no relation, who is driving to the resort town of Silent Hill for a vacation with his daughter Cheryl, and to sell some molly at the beach party, but almost gets caught by the cop driving past him, but that's beside the point. During the drive, a girl appears on the road fulfilling her lifelong dream of being a deer caught in headlights. Naturally, Harry swerves out of the way to avoid the girl and ends up crashing. When he wakes up, he finds Cheryl is missing. He goes out to find her and then... What's going on here? Yeah. Turns out it was a dream and Harry wakes up to find the police officer from earlier. Her name is Sybil Bennett. Thankfully, you left the drugs back in the Jeep. Anyway, Sybil gives you a gun and lets you get on your way to find Cheryl. 
Along the way, you'll meet a collection of clever and colorful characters. Actually, no you won't. There's Lisa Garland, the frightened nurse. Michael Kaufman, a shifty curmudgeon of a doctor. What seems to be a phantom of a teenage girl. And Dahlia Gillespie, a totally sane, direct, and punctual woman who definitely isn't the antagonist of the game. I've been expecting you. It was foretold by gyromancy. <laughs> Now for a game that's older than a good deal of you watching this video have been alive, presentation-wise it's still fairly decent. Of course, it doesn't come without its speed bumps. The art direction of this game is fucking spot on. I really was absorbed into this foggy, eerie atmosphere and I never felt safe and was always put on edge ready to bash some faces in. Not being able to see 10 feet in front of you actually works in the game's favor because, on a technical standpoint, this helped with the game being able to handle a set amount of things on the screen but it also accentuated the sense of unease and genuine fear of the unknown. The macabre art style tells the game's story almost entirely on its own. And that's a good thing because when people actually have to speak... Was I dreaming? How do you feel? Oh, like I've been run over by a truck. But I'm alright, I guess. Yeah, the voice work is the aspect of the Hollywood feel Team Silent should have kept. This was being made the same time as Metal Gear Solid, and despite what your opinion on that franchise may be, it was undeniably a game changer in terms of video game voice acting. It's bad, but in a funny way. It may not have as many cringeworthy lines as Resident Evil, but I certainly had a chuckle whenever Harry opened his mouth. So to speak. Thankfully, that's the only audio hiccup Silent Hill has, because the score and sound design is amazing. It sports incredible range from moody and atmospheric. To beautiful and heartbreaking melodies. Pieces that at least make sense contextually. music to sleep to. How the controls feel is widely subjective. Silent Hill featured the infamous tank controls. Keep in mind, this was the PS1 days. Most of us had this controller with no analog sticks. And though the DualShock had already been out for a year, it wasn't really required for a great deal of games. Many gamers scoff at tank controls, but honestly, I didn't really mind it at all while playing this. I easily got acclimated to the control scheme and I was dodging harpies and gray demon children in no time. Although I could never nail down the fact that the triangle button was for the map and the select button was for the menu. I kept pressing one when I meant the other, but that's purely my own dumbass fault. But during my second playthrough, there was one thought that lingered with me throughout. What the hell is Silent Hill? I mean, I understand it in context. Daughter goes missing in a spooky town that has a hellish parallel dimension meeting up with some peculiar characters, but... There was a deeper element here that was intentionally left esoteric so that the player could develop their own interpretations as to what was going on in this world. There is exposition in the game, but it's not totally spoon-fed to you. You pick up a piece of the puzzle at the beginning of the game and not find the piece that fits into it until close to the end. And even then, the game doesn't totally explain everything outright. And that's not a bad thing. So from what I've gathered in my second playthrough of the game, and after doing a little bit of research on the internet, Here's what I think exactly what happens in the events of Silent Hill. Needless to say, there will be spoilers. <gasps> Harry and Cheryl go to Silent Hill because Cheryl is somehow drawn to it. The town is empty and infested with monsters due to the actions of a cult which, surprise surprise, is led by Dahlia Gillespie who explains that Silent Hill is being enveloped by a nightmarish hellscape due to glyphs called the Mark of Simael being carved into certain points of the town. On your quest to rescue Cheryl, you keep encountering the phantom of a girl who, oddly enough, looks like an older version of Cheryl. You eventually learn that her name is Alessa in a room in a hospital where some fucked up shit happened. You also learn that a major drug network was ingrained in Silent Hill which funded the cult and may have metaphorically and possibly literally turned its citizens into demonic monstrosities. It's eventually revealed that Cheryl isn't Harry's biological daughter and that he discovered her on the roadside one day after a major fire. You also come across the revelation that Alessa and Cheryl are one and the same due to the fact that Alessa split her soul into two using an item called the Flowers creating Cheryl in the form of a baby. This was done in order to prevent the birth of a god, a conspiracy orchestrated by Dahlia. Alessa was badly burned in the fire mentioned earlier, but was kept alive by Lisa, who became mentally scarred by Alessa's charred body and physically dependent on drugs supplied by Coffin, who, by the way, is also in on the plan to have her give birth to a god. Now, there are multiple endings to this game, and it all depends on whether or not you pick up certain items and whether or not you choose to perform certain tasks, 
With that being said... In our original playthrough on Goatface Gaming, we wandered into a hotel and got a key which went into a motorcycle holding a bottle containing drugs. Kaufman promptly took that bottle from us and gave us a scolding. We made our way like normal until we got to the amusement park, where we find that Sybil has been possessed by some demonic entity. Not knowing any other option, we were forced to kill her. That's because we didn't know that in the hospital way back in the story, you were supposed to take a plastic bottle in the kitchen and scoop up some strange liquid in the doctor's office that you could use to save her. After we made our way through a place beyond logic called Nowhere, which took us FOREVER, by the way, we discovered that Dahlia is about to combine Cheryl and Alessa in order to give birth to the god she dreamed of, only to be thwarted by Kaufman who throws the bottle we found at the new god and explodes. The drug causes evil energy to spill out of the incubator, killing Dahlia, and POP GOES THE DEMON! What followed was one of the most bullshit and badly designed final boss battles I've ever come across. So we found ourselves face to face with the Incubus. We rarely used our guns, so we figured it would be a perfect time to unload on him, and I died. During our slog through nowhere, we used up all of our healing items, and the fucking Incubus launches lightning attacks that can essentially one-shot you, and those attacks are extremely hard to dodge. If you had even one, maybe two healing items, all you had to do was just stand there and put about 16 rifle shots into the boss, and he's dead. It's a shoddily designed sham of a final boss that's a cakewalk if you have healing items and unnecessarily frustrating if you don't. After dying 10 times trying to kill this motherfucker, we finally emerge triumphant. The world begins to crumble around us, and Alessa uses the last of her power to create a baby, which she gives to Harry, and create a portal to escape to... a blooper reel? That's the end, and that was considered the good ending. No. In order to get the best ending, good plus, you have to save Sybil. So in my second playthrough, I made damn sure that I got everything. Because I'm a goddamn champion. Get the bottle, scoop the goop, get the motorcycle key, have Kaufman give a shit, get behind Cheryl and pour the liquid on the back of her head, be treated to some exposition about Cheryl, get five seconds of extra cutscenes in the final battle, kill the Incubus again, this time with all the ammo and healing items, and BAM! Good plus ending. Only change is that Sybil escapes with you and this little three second CG movie. Okay, that's a slightly happier ending, but one question still remained in the back of my head. Is any of this shit happening even real? That sounds like a stupid question, but there are clues suggesting that what is happening isn't really happening. The town is snowing out of season and constantly covered in fog, giving off the feeling of a dreamlike state. All the roads going in and out of Silent Hill have been destroyed, literally trapping Harry in this nightmare. There's even a point where Harry becomes semi-self-aware thinking he could be in a hospital bed in a coma-induced dream. The final boss in the good ending is an incubus, which, fun fact, is a demon that haunts and seduces people in their dreams. Think Freddy Krueger before Freddy Krueger. Well, there is an answer. It just depends on which ending you get. The good ending implies that everything Harry went through was real and technically considered canon, seeing as how in Silent Hill 3, you play as Heather Mason, Harry's reincarnated daughter. But in the bad endings, it was all a dream, because you see Harry back in his car, dead. Which meant none of this ever happened. And the UFO ending, well, I guess Team Silent wanted to show that they had a sense of humor. I ask this because Silent Hill for the PS1 is the only game in the series that I ever played and beat. I played Homecoming for the 360 some years back and honestly couldn't get into it. And what I've read and watched about other people experiencing Silent Hill seem more personal and psychologically affecting than what I've experienced. Yeah, those elements were still there, but it seems as though those aspects were improved upon in later releases. Which leads me to asking you, the audience, this question. How should I go about playing the subsequent games in these series? I know that the HD remakes of Silent Hill 2 and 3 were total clusterfucks on release, but I heard that the PS3 versions were patched, so did that make those worth playing? Also, I've become a trophy whore and I want to get all the trophies I can get! If not, I'd be fine playing the original versions on the PlayStation 2, but I don't think it would translate very well on my HD television. I suppose I'd have to save up for a CRT setup and get the best experience possible. On its release, Silent Hill received generally favorable reviews with scores ranging from 8s to 9s and went on to sell over 2 million copies worldwide. 
It spawned five sequels, a prequel, an arcade shooter, a complete reimagining of the original game, a movie that was critically panned but generally accepted by fans, a sequel to said movie that pretty much everyone hated, and a reboot that will never see the light of day thanks to Konami being Konami. While I can't say the game hasn't aged well, there are certainly aspects that have rusted quite a bit, but overall, I'm glad I played it. In terms of horror, I can appreciate the effort in haunting the player rather than just scaring them. Although in my first playthrough, there were definitely moments that caught me off guard. I guess you can get him close, get him closer to the light, that way you can probably see when he opens- OH SHIT! Oh, that's open. That's when he opens it up. He's opening it up right now. Straight. Okay. All right. It's closed. Oh, oh fuck! Shit. Oh fuck! Oh god! Ah. That's like a one-hit KO right there. If you're looking for a physical copy of the game, it's gonna run you about thirty dollars on Amazon or eBay, complete in box. However, if you own a PS3 or a Vita, you can download it from the PlayStation Store for only six dollars. If you're going into it completely blind the first time around, like I did, it'll take you around six to seven hours and most of the time will be spent trying to solve the game's numerous clever puzzles, most of which can be figured out by remembering what the green text said. But there is one puzzle in particular involving a piano, and if you're musically illiterate, like I am, you may as well look up a guide for that solution. But my second playthrough only took me about three hours, and in order to get the best ranking possible, you need to finish it in less than two. Just save all your ammo for the bosses, and you should be fine. What Silent Hill lacks in outright scares more than makes up for it with a chilling mystery and macabre symbolism. And from what I've read, it only gets more fucked up from there, which gives credence to the phrase in the intro cinematic, the fear of blood tends to create fear for the flesh. I'm PM Rance. Happy Halloween, and if you're gonna fuck with someone this holiday season, only do it to the extent to where it's just short of you getting arrested. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and I need to give a very special thank you to Sean Campbell, Nicholas Blackman, Will Stonehouse, Casty, Q Player, Jackson Smith, Mitch Jackson, Michael Perry Jr., Austin Daniel Selkowitz, Jack Gore, Ethan Parker, Kodo Sinclair, Bon Lanyez, Mario Mariquin, Rodolfo De Lara, Ramona Viking Hansen, Cynical Carlos, and Michael Groot. And one more time, I need to give a very special thank you to Todd Palasik for this pledge. This was actually really fun to write for and review, so the incentive is about to be reset, so keep an eye out for that. And see you guys next time.